experience is having done my MFA entirely online through Savannah College of Art and Design, I know that there are a lot of great benefits to doing so despite being in a field that is very tactile or hands-on. So it's an open source, socially interactive, and cross device capable learning management system built for those that learn visually. Why does this matter? Uh, with this system, I'm trying to optimize learning outcomes. Uh, specifically, I want study to be able to uh, measure course content in retention, learning outcomes, social experiences, and propose improved visual forms based on that feedback. So, student logs into the system, they're interacting with it, I can track everything they're doing at practically any minute, both through Google Analytics and through some uh, internal software. And, you know, I can see where they're clicking around, how long they're clicking, and, you know, for example, if it's a brief click, uh, was that by accident, or if it's a long click, is it because a graphic isn't loading? So I can drill down very, very intensely here. But ultimately, all of the feedback, all of the data will allow me to create visuals that will appeal to the students. Where did it all begin? Uh, it began as me as a, with me as a desperate graphic design educator. Um, to give you a frame of reference, I just turned 30. I started teaching when I was 24. Uh, and I started uh, not in the public university realm, but the private university realm. And uh, my options there, it was a private Catholic school, so my options were extremely limited in what I could use. So I was forced to innovate uh, using open source technology. Now Blackboard was available to me, but if you know how much your students love or not love Blackboard, uh, you can pretty much figure that that wasn't going to work for art students that generally don't like to read or write. They like to be creating in the studio. All right. So it was uh, also a reaction to students, specifically design students, posting their work in progress online. Uh, I don't know if any of you can relate to this specific point, but I have a lot of students that post their work their design work in progress on Facebook, on Twitter, and they're connected to professionals. Those professionals are the same type of people that could be responsible for giving them internships or freelance work or other employment opportunities. And those professionals were looking at this work as it was, an as it was complete. So they could be looking at a piece of crap design assume it's finished, and then that tarnishes the reputation of not only uh, my program, but myself and my students. So the social interactive component to study is meant to, to prevent the release of that unfinished work. So I'm trying to offer worry-free but contextual critique inside of a secure website. What type is being used? What are my open sources? The study LMS is built using WordPress. Do I have any WordPress fans in here? Okay, thank you. I feel like I'm in a, I'm in a room of people that are my best friends now. Um, yeah, I'm using WordPress for the CMS. Uh, I, I, I believe that WordPress has uh, a, a very broad capability uh, in terms of being able to be manipulated, modified. You can build plugins for it, themes for it rather easily. Uh, so I like how robust it is. Um, and we can get into the CMS wars battle later. But uh, the, the most important thing for me is that the, the barrier for entry is lower. All right, I, I can teach someone how to use WordPress inside of an hour. If you can use Microsoft Word, you can use WordPress. Yeah, there's a learning curve, but it's possible. It can happen. All right. So I'm using WordPress as the primary platform, and since I implemented this, it's gone through several phases, several different combinations of plugins. Um, but the primary goal was to either use open source, free technology, or tech that was relatively affordable. And by that I mean under $1,000. And even that is a bit too expensive. So, entry level. Uh, this now I'm going to kind of time jump a little bit, so I apologize if this gets a little confusing. All right, when study was first initiated, I was using uh, shared server space on Bluehost. Has anyone ever used Bluehost? Uh, okay, so we got a few folks here. Uh, shared servers, whatever your your hosting platform, can really stink. Uh, you're not going to get a lot of 
uh, mileage out of a shared server space. So I installed study. I've got 30 people in a class using this system and it crashes every other day because the students are using it with such fast frequency that it maxes out the bandwidth and consequently it goes down and I'm up the river because the students can't gain access to their materials. So it was reasonably priced, but it just wasn't sufficient. It wasn't sustainable. Too many stressor, stressors, max out the bandwidth. Have to move on though. Another robust uh, solution was necessary. Virtual private servers. Did anyone ever use a VPS? VPSs are expensive. Uh, very expensive, and depending on your level, if you're enterprise, I don't even want to know how much you're paying for that. But even for me, right now, I'm dropping 500 bucks a year on a virtual private server space using a company called Arvix. But it works, it's sustainable. So the second phase, with the VPS supporting the study LMS, the infrastructure was handled reasonably well. Um, I didn't have to worry too much about that. Now focusing on the user experience, um, there's four different open source WordPress templates that I, were, that I was using. You know how WordPress templates are. They can be incredible, like the ones you see on ThemeForest that cost anywhere from $40 to $60. They're incredible, they have all the bells and whistles. Um, yet somehow, they never quite do the one thing that you want them to. Uh, so you have to custom develop that or you have to uh, work around it. Um, but I was using four different templates. Essentially, I would switch the templates out twice a semester. Now, that confused matters, but I'm still testing the waters. I'm trying to figure out just exactly how my students want this content delivered to them. Uh, do they want it simple, quick, and easy, or would they rather have more bells and whistles and have more of a shine to it? Overall, uh, the UX was full of mixed reactions. They liked being a part of the progress. See, one of the great things about this project is I never made any illusions about what it was. I didn't tell the students, hey, I made this thing and you're going to use it and it's going to be fantastic. I said, this is going to be a pain in the ass. We're going to have fun working through it and I apologize, don't get mad at me. Um, but they liked being a part of the progress. They liked being able to make contributions and content uh, and make the system more than what it was. The problem there, though, is that once that semester ended, once they got their grade, it flatlined. So even that required a different line of thinking. Um, right around the time the third phase came around, you can see this really poor, poorly done logo here. And feel free to make fun of me for that. Uh, right around the time phase three came around, I had uh, created a new startup company called Up2. And uh, real quick, Uptu's whole purpose was to connect entrepreneurs with relevant service providers. You need a lawyer, I got that person for you. You need an accountant, go over uh, to X person, okay? So I wanted to tether Uptu and study uh, together in a branded capacity um, and sort of you know, create a larger suite of, of opportunities. But the, the biggest takeaway here is that Study needed to be social. I don't want to use the phrase social network because everyone wants that uh, and they seem to think that that can appear out of thin air and it doesn't require much work to happen. But um, with WordPress, that was a little bit easier to accommodate. So having said that, phase four and five, now I'm, I get the idea that, okay, I've got the technology hardware, I've got the hardware in place, I understand that this needs to have a branded solution behind it. I do need to market this to my students to use uh, on, a, on a broader capacity than just fall and spring semesters. I want them to use it year round. So phases four and five, I, I found some, some, uh, some ground here that I could exist on for quite a while, all right? Plus, it was social. Uh, has anyone used Buddy Press in here? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <clears throat> Buddy Press enabled students to log in with their own account, their own user handle. They could log in on their tablet, their phone, their computer. Um, they could make their own avatar picture or they could choose one from their desktop. They could contribute to forums and critique other people's work. So finally, the, the dream is coming to, uh, to fruition. Definitely new life 
was being given to it inside and outside of the classroom. This is an example of phases four and five, uh, no longer in operation. You can see this is a rather banal type of WordPress template. Not that exciting, um, but a lot, of, a lot of clean white space, not hard on the eyes, easy to interpret, uh, easy to, you don't have to fight here. Anytime I design a web page, I want it to be quick, easy, navigable, intuitive, accessible. Um, and sometimes short and to the point, but that very rarely happens. Uh, this here, I stripped away all the bells and whistles and focused on the functionality. And that went over pretty well. You can see here, or just barely, because it's all garbled because of the resolution, but this is actually a student's work, and then this would be a comment. Uh, I think it's just a general comment below it. But um, finally, I was able to critique my student's work at any time online as it was being developed, and that was incredible. This is what the homepage looked like. Uh, aside from being a social uh, hub, again, I don't want to use that, that phrase, network, aside from being a social hub where students can log in, it was also an active blog. They could share content. Uh, these were all Twitter accounts for all of our Twitter, excuse me, are all Twitter accounts for each class in the curriculum. So the, the social complexity is getting even more dense. This is an example of uh, what a class page looks like. Um, tried to keep it as simple and managed as I could. Um, I, I'm speaking from experience, and if you disagree with me, please tell me that you disagree with me. Um, but when I was doing my online learning through Blackboard, I didn't like having a billion modules that I'd have to click through. It seems like it would never, ever end. And I wanted to make expectations uh, managed and very clear. All right. So content, um, also keep in mind, I'm still in the brick and mortar atmosphere. So I have a lot of flexibility, but in terms of content, I made it all available at once. Uh, every project throughout the semester was available. You can see what was needed, when the deadlines were due. You could download uh, calendar integration through iCal. Everything was there, and if there were any issues, I could just make an update relatively easily. Next section here, uh, these are groups, uh, forums. So each class would have its own specific forum. Uh, one of the key points is right here, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, we've got West Liberty University and AIGA. AIGA is the American Institute of Graphic Artists, which is the um, basically the, the professional organization for design. So what I'm trying to do with these two groups is, hey, study works here at YSU. Why can't it work in another institution? Why can't our students collaborate in this entire process, this ecosystem. And furthermore, with AIGA, why can't we bring in some of their board members or some professionals that are in the know and are willing to critique work and be a part of the learning process voluntarily? And surprisingly, this worked out really well. People really were engaged and they were excited to be a part of the process. So, uh, phase six, we're getting towards, more towards present day here. Uh, you can see there's a new brand, okay? Um, and it's been transformed once again, and I'll show you that momentarily. The, uh, the technology is always changing, not just on the hardware side, but the software side. So BuddyPress keeps updating itself. WordPress updates itself like every three months. Uh, so it, as an open source choice, is really quite optimal. Uh, except, and tell me if you can understand my plight here, the vulnerabilities of WordPress. Um, they are, uh, especially <coughs> as of late, uh, very, very uh, present. Um, with the latest update, I believe that uh, with, with all the plugin, like every plugin is, there's a weakness now because of the latest update, which makes my life a lot of fun. So, uh, I want to talk about visual learners really quick. Um, do, do any of you have any experience teaching artists or 
uh, bird students or any interactions there? Okay. Um, then maybe you, you understand where I'm coming from. But uh, a little bit about teaching and learning visually. How artists need to teach. So, uh, number one, I'm, I was never trained how to teach. Uh, artists don't train each other how to teach. So, when we teach, it's, it's very personal. Uh, it's, it's intuitive. It's instinctual. Okay, so it's very easy for us to uh, go off topic or divert in one direction from another. Okay. We develop our teaching style mostly as we go. I started teaching when I was 24 in higher ed, which is insane, and I get that. And it was like being thrown into the deep end and expecting to swim, uh, or be expected to swim. But uh, we develop our style mostly as we go. So for artists, online teaching isn't even in the realm of possibility. Uh, and even if it is, it's used incredibly minimal. So for example, a peer of mine at YSU uses Blackboard but only uses it for grading. That's it. No course content, no syllabus, nothing. You log in as a student, and then you see your grade. There are no comments on it. You just see two numbers, and that's it. Uh, incredible waste of, of resources. And I don't know how the licensing works, but I can imagine that that's a huge, uh, huge drain on, on budgets. So outside of that, our teachings are experiential, experimental, tangible, active, improvisational, and always visual. So, you know, this presentation has a bunch of type, but I'm really trying not to read off of it, because this is supposed to be a learning document that you can use later, possibly, okay? So I'm improvising a lot of my presentation. I didn't practice this at all, and I'm sure I'm mixing my words, but in my mind, I sound great. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, and I'm moving around the space, so it's very active. So, having said that, our lessons come heavily from experience in the field and how we ourselves are taught. How do artists learn? They identify the main building blocks by way of witnessing the engagement of best practices and tools, materials, philosophies, and styles, all within the creative process. That's a lot of words to say they observe their mentors or their professors in the studio, working, involved in the creative process, making things. All right, then I cast them out, go forth and create good things. They break things, they reconfigure, they send them back out for critique, they come back in, revise, 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 experiment. Kind of a convoluted process, especially in comparison to the STEM field. So do I have any STEM people in here? No? Oh, really? Okay. All right. Um, I think your experimentation would have a lot of rationale behind it, whereas ours would be like, I don't like that shape, throw it all out, start over. Um, so it's, it's deeply subjective. And then finally, they assess and critique, reconfigure, reassess, so on and so forth. So that's how artists teach, and that's how artists learn. Anything to add on that? No, I just like going on. Yep, okay. Okay, so you're tracking with me, perfect. All right, so that doesn't exactly translate well to, to the online learning atmosphere. So what are the borders and the boundaries, okay? Um, essentially, visual learning is a teaching and learning style in which ideas, concepts, data, and other information are associated with images and techniques. So imagine you're in a, in a Blackboard environment, you're taking a course, and there are no modules. <laughs> there's, there's no text. But there's a lot of heavy graphics. There's a lot of infographics. There may be some animated types of videos. Okay, um, There may be games that you can play. Now, I'm not saying that that's exclusive. Exclusively how visual learners learn. Of course, they can read and write large bodies of text, but they don't like to, and they sure as hell fight it every chance they get. Um, so the idea here is, I need to create an overarching narrative that's engaging and interactive. And having a, a, a very nicely designed shell around that also helps. So uh, retention of, 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 of learning. Experimental, personal, and experiential. The process of creating art or utilizing creativity to solve problems are all of those things, but they're always goal-driven. Now those goals 
are almost always deeply personal, all right? They're not to necessarily, you know, make money or productize something or monetize something. It could just be self-expression, okay? Um, in terms of uh, enrollment, learning outcomes, it's, it's heavier because the process is so intensely personal. Moving on from there, um, the use of compelling visually, compelling visually appealing aesthetically driven graphics creates a stronger impression and subsequent comprehension and retention of the subject matter. Um, it's why infographics are so useful. Anyone use infographics? Where do you get them from? Make them sometimes. Make them sometimes using picture chart? No, I use Photoshop. Yes, awesome, <laughs> fantastic. The, that's just icing on the cake when they're like completely customized. But if you don't have access to Photoshop or have it but don't want to learn how to use it, then there are other tools available for you to use. Um, but uh, infographics are fantastic. And I'm gonna close this out real quick and show you an example <coughs> of a particular infographic that a student of mine made. So there's no audio here, um, but to give you some context, the, the students don't outrightly know this, but I tell them after the fact. When they create projects for my courses, the intent is that they're always used in some official type of public capacity. So this actually has a lot of relevance to Youngstown, all right? Um, the second part is I use that content. They're generating all this content. I put it back into study. Um, so that way, there's a perpetual cycle of content generation. So, um, check this out. So, what do you think? Uh, Interested? Okay. Uh, we don't need to watch that one. Hopefully it's assuming. Uh, that's, another, that's a whole other presentation. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the understanding of visuals, comprehension, like you may not have known anything about Youngstown, Ohio before seeing that, but after seeing it, you're going to hopefully remember that. And that's the type of visuals that I'm talking about uh, using inside of study, all right? So the fact that that was student-generated is just even better. Growth in the creative process. The achievement of goals in the creative process can be considered on a slight, smaller scale or a massive one. It depends on the artist. Again, this is, uh, this is a value, really a value proposition for visual learners, okay? Um, achievement, not only in mastering technique, but mastering self-expression, uh, which, if you know of any artist, that's impossible to master, right? So, assessment is subjective. Conceptual development, this is, uh, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to protect 
the students from sharing this information. It's one thing that you don't know the software. I can teach a software to anyone, but it's an entirely different thing when they put a concept out there into the world and then people shit on it. And they, they skewer them and tear them apart. Um, it doesn't matter how good your, your learning environment is, that's a hard thing to, uh, to bounce back from. But um, they're always assessing and critiquing, not only in person but online. And uh, I unfortunately don't have an example to show you, but one person posts a terrible graphic and like a hundred people just critique and critique and critique. Uh, it can get pretty brutal. So, uh, applications. I've got some pictures I'm going to show you here in a moment. Um, Coming back to the fourth and fifth phase where I needed to market this a little bit more, the idea of branding, okay? Branding these courses, and especially if I've got different pockets of, of this study LMS at different universities and, or it's all connected in one, uh, it's important to differentiate the courses. So the following squares are used to brand the individual courses. This is just visual wayfinding. Uh, I don't know if anyone brands their courses or has ever considered that. Um, this is particularly useful to me uh, for an example I'll show you in a minute. But basically, what you're looking at here, uh, just a basic spectrum of colors. There's no rhyme or reason to the color selections, but the students associate certain colors with a particular class. That's a learned, taught uh, system. So when they're in study looking at these branded squares, these branded icons, anytime they see a particular color, they know, okay, purple, I'm not in graphic design studio problems, uh, so I can ignore that. Um, so it's a way for me to have a lot of color, a lot of liveliness, a very active website, but also train them on how to recognize uh, particular systems. Um, here's another uh, reason why I wanted to have the, uh, the branding. Uh, visual learners enjoy play. Um, a lot of people think that art students pay a lot of money to go to school to just play, uh, to play around, and uh, that's definitely not the case. There's a lot of, a lot of hard work going into it, but um, mobile app development. Does anyone have any area of expertise in mobile apps, online learning? Okay. Um, with this, this most recent phase, I want students to be able to go onto a desktop and work with the study LMS or do it on, uh, on their phone or tablet. Now, having a responsive HTML5 based site is going to enable that. Um, is Blackboard responsive yet? I don't even know. I, I don't think so. Okay, the looks you're giving me are saying, stop talking about Blackboard, all right? Um, but uh, mobile app development, I wanted to be able to offer my students an app. If you go to the iTunes store right now, type in History and Theory of Graphic Design, you'll be able to find this application for your phone and tablet. Um, visually driven, there's consistency across the board in study with these apps, more so uh, the apps are controlled by WordPress. So I have one hub, not only to control the social media, but to control the back end of some of these apps. Now this is, this is browser-based tech, really easy, simple stuff to build. All right, I'm not really innovating here.